last few months in Aden were, were awful. They were absolutely awful. We kept moving down closer to the runway and they closed areas behind it, kept it protected um, because we were constantly under attack from local terrorist groups. Colin Munslow. I'm 80 years of age. I was uh, born in 1943. I spent 25 years in the Air Force and I was a Master Air Electronics Operator or the equivalent of a Warrant Officer. My name is John Beale. I, was, I joined the Air Force. I was called up for national service. Couldn't manage on 27 shillings a week so I signed on for three but I stayed for 38 years. Uh, I was supposed to end my service career at 55 and then they asked me to stay in for another three years which I did and I retired as a warrant officer uh, in at the end of 92. I arrived at Aden in uh, August of 53 um, as a jet mechanic. That was the, the squadron at that time was 8 Squadron which they had been flying Buckmasters and Brigands, which were old World War II aircraft. And now they were transforming to vampires. And I had recently been trained as a, a jet mechanic rather than piston. And we arrived in Aden and uh, helped them convert the, to the vampire aircraft as a fighter bomber. Aden at that time was you couldn't say it was a pleasant place to be because the, the food was disgusting and the water was de uh, desalinated. And the, the food generally was grotty. But Steamer Point, the town, was pretty easy going. Um, boredom was the main thing. If you were into sports, which I was, uh, my afternoons were occupied running around the track and water polo on Saturday and Sunday. So life was nearly hostile free at the time, I'd say. Just about once every five or six weeks, one of the forts on the border would get attacked and the vampire squadron would then spend the next two or three days bombing and strafing and firing a few rockets and bullets. Um, and that occurred throughout my tour. Well, I went to Aden um, close to the end of, its, of a, a military base in 1967, in February 1967. Um, the place was in turmoil because the locals all wanted rid of us. Uh, so it was a very unpleasant tour in 1967. Apart from the temperature, which regularly was well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You had sort of 90% humidity, which was the worst thing. You perspired 24 hours a day. You got up in the morning, your bed was soaking wet. You put on a fresh set of KD. By the time you got down to work at the hangar... Soaking, soaking wet. Soaking wet. Yeah. There was no relief from it. Even the water in the shower was warm because of the tank on the roof. It was an uncomfortable tour. What John is relating to and, and, and my experience is, is totally different, of course, because we weren't even allowed off camp. So we were restricted to on camp. So uh, the social life there was the naffy, in my case, because I was a corporal at the time. A um, few beers. Uh, they, they showed some good films and we used to have uh, and what they call those, those entertainers used to fly out from the UK. Um, they used to do those shows you've seen on, you know, films. Jim Davidson and people yeah, like that. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike and Bernie Winters came, I, I, I seem to remember, and, and girls who would be dancing and singing and stuff, which were really very sight. attractive uh, <laughs> when you had been away from, yeah. uh, from home for a long time. My role there was to uh, change the role of an aeroplane. An aeroplane might come in carrying freight 
and go out carrying passengers. So therefore the seats needed to be fitted within the airplane. So I had a team of men working for me and we'd go into the airplane, fit the seats and off it would go and we'd wait for the next job. Um, this was done shift work 24 hours on, 24 hours off. And during that 24 hours off, we often had to do guard duty. In 1967, the war between Israel and Egypt closed the Suez Canal and all our supplies were, came through the Suez Canal. So we were then left with, with basically war rations. We lived for about a month um, on, on just tins of corned beef and, yeah. and uh, <laughs> it, it, was, it was pretty shocking. You very quickly lost anything in the way of any fresh food or fresh meat or anything. We just had these ships trapped in the Suez Canal full of, full of uh, our supplies. So they then had to start flying them in. Um, Britannia started doing it. Um, and then, of course, they could never really cope with the numbers uh, on an aeroplane as opposed to what you can bring on a ship. So conditions in Aden were pretty bad. Yeah, we very rarely saw fruit. They had a Lincoln squadron at uh, Eastleigh in Kenya. So the bombs and ammunition were brought into Aden and every week there would be two or three Lincolns would come up to collect the bombs to take back. And we, somebody in the catering department really thinking ahead said, well, if you're coming back this way from Kenya, can you bring fruit? And that was the first time we saw pineapples and apples and pairs. So they were bringing a Bombay full of fruit up to Aden and taking back Bombay full of bombs. Crazy, but true. <laughs> With the Bombay called the Fruit Bay. <laughs> we were force fed salt, which I could never understand. It's, it's made me addicted to salt. I can't have anything without salt now. Yeah, I know. But the officer commanding the, uh, the daily duty officer would come round the mess and add salt to your dinner or force you to take salt tablets. Salt tablets were the size of your thumbnail. And you swallowed it and within 10 minutes you Otherwise vomited. you were totally dehydrated. Yeah. This stopped dehydration. You drank copious quantities of shy tea, as shy as it's called yeah. there. But, uh, yeah. The last few months in Aden were, were awful. We were absolutely awful. We kept moving down closer to the runway and they closed areas behind it, kept it protected um, because we were constantly under attack from local terrorist groups. It became very hostile. Yeah. And, and could you elaborate on when you say it became very hostile? Um, we had to uh, surround the aircraft on the, on the pan with steel drums mounted three high because it was a regular occurrence for the terrorists to fire mortars from the causeway, which joined part of Aden to another part of Aden, into the airfield. And of course, an explosion had to be contained within the area it, it hit. Um, it was often, we were often getting pings off the, the, the hangar doors where f fire, had, had opened fire at the hangar. Um, and you didn't know who your enemy was. You weren't fighting face to face with somebody in a uniform. They were just the ordinary chap. They all wore the same clothing. Very difficult to know whether you were safe or not. But on one particular day, the, the, the really bad day in 1967, which caused us to go to active service, uh, there were 72 people either killed or injured in one day. 22 dead, 50 injured. I mean, that's quite something. I will honestly say that Aden was the most difficult part of my, my career by a long, long, long way. I came here in 1958 to RF St Morgan, got attached to uh, 42 Squadron, which were flying Shackleton Mark IIs at the time. And we were, the squadron was committed uh, once a year we would go out there to relieve the squadron that was Shackleton squadron that was there for a month. Um, 64 was fairly quiet, just the occasional bombing and strafing as usual. 
65 was a little bit worse, 66 things started to change and there was a, quite a bit of hostility then. And rather than get sent for guard duties, we were committed to stay inside RAF Kamaksa and turn the aircraft around as quickly as possible. And that was our job. We didn't do guard duties, we were there to fly airplanes and we needed to mend them when they flew. It was only, it was not only uh, reconnaissance, but we were there for air sea rescue as well. Uh, if a dinghy was spotted or somebody went down in the sea, we could locate them and direct operations from there. We, uh, we were returning from a, another deployment from Madagascar and we had to fly back into Aden. This is in 60, the end of 66. Um, there was a, a transit hotel there where all the families would be, have to go before they came back to UK. And we were housed there, for, we flew into from Madagascar to Aden, stayed at this transit hotel. We went down to breakfast one morning and it looked like hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. There was one of the chefs with his arm bandaged, another one with his head bandaged, and another one was talking silly. And we said, what happened to you then? And they were in a, a pub along the Marla Strait. And the, an Arab went by, tossed a grenade in, and they managed to turn the table over and hide behind that to take most of the shrapnel. And they were at work next morning. It was that close. Nothing was, no, you weren't safe at all. Yeah, trouble with me, I saw Aiden at the good times and I saw it at the bad times. And the bad times were very bad. Yeah, it was not a nice place to be. What was the, what was the, uh, there was a, a, a camp, I think at Mercurius, so it was about 3,000 feet up. So it was, if you had septic prickly, prickly heat, and it came out in great blisters, the medic would put you on this aeroplane and send you up to Mercurius which was on the Yemen border. And a Beverly landed up there one day and taxied along the taxiway, which is not very big. And uh, a mine mm, had mine. been planted in the runway and blew its wheel off. Mm. And I, I believe that Beverly's still there. You know? <laughs> the SAS used to use the Beverly to parachute out of, they be taken out up country, they'd parachute out and they'd make their own way home. Nobody would uh, help them get it back. Good training. In, uh, in 1967, they, they were all unaccompanied tours. The, the families were not allowed to go there. The place was becoming more and more dangerous every, every day almost. And come the middle of 1967, the families that were there, people who'd been uh, the previous two years, we'll say, they were all evacuated out. All the families, wives, children, everybody like that was evacuated out because we couldn't keep them safe. The weapon of choice from the, from the terrorists was a grenade. Uh, you have no sort of uh, chance of finding who's thrown it. They, they get in a little group, somebody would lob a grenade at you. It was pretty, uh, pretty frightening place to be at times. And of course, uh, the problem with an unaccompanied tour in those days you had to find somewhere for your wife to live. She couldn't stay in the marriage quarter you had at Lynham. She had to go and find somewhere else. So I had to find a, a surplus marriage quarter and she ended up in Wilmslow, uh, just near Manchester. Um, she was very unhappy um, about me being away and it caused a lot of problems for uh, a lot of people. I was fortunate, I, I managed to keep a marriage, but lots of people lost their marriage because of uh, unaccompanied tours. It's 12 months, you know, it wasn't um, a short term thing, it was 12 months, you were away for 12 months. It, mar marriage problems, uh, friends who got Dear John type letters, you know, uh, they were devastated. Blueies, they were called. Yeah. Letter was the only means of communication, of course, I mean, completely different than things today, but uh, the letter was the most important thing you could have. A letter from home was important. The ladies' part of Aden was fairly scarce, to say the least. There was 4,000 troops and 40 WAFs, 
So the chances of uh, courting anybody were fairly remote. As I say, if you've worked 24 hour shift and then you go on guard, which is two on, four off, two on, four off, two on, four off, the other 24 hours and then back on shift, there is no life, but everybody's doing the same. So the morale is quite good. So it was an extremely difficult time, but you were you saying that you came together? Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was a, a, a good sort of environment to be in if you were with your mates. You, you cover your mate and he cover your back. Yeah. Unfortunately, people back home didn't even know there was a war going on in Aden. They didn't even know where Aden was. You say to somebody, you're doing a tour in Aden, they say, where's that? You know, and, uh, you felt a bit neglected, basically. Nobody knew what was going on. You, the best you could get was the occasional letter from home saying what was going on. And basically, people back home were not aware of it at all. And you do get a sense of, what am I doing all this for if they don't recognise it back at base? And as far as remembrance is concerned, I don't know if you're aware, but all the graves of the service people out in Aden have all been desecrated, totally destroyed. Now, remembrance means something different to yeah, us. Yeah, it does indeed than it does to the rest of the people. We've actually built a memorial in the, in the Cornwall at War Museum because the, there is no other memorial now to those poor souls who lost their lives. And there's over 400 of them in those, in those graves. ISIS destroyed the graves of all the Christians. Just from the with a sledgehammer. So it means something different to us. A sex Aiden. Yeah. We've got a book of remembrance at the museum and I, I went through it page by page. And from early on, we're talking, you know, the odd 50 or 60 years back, there's 515 people served in Aden and didn't return. That's a lot of people, lot. but it was over a long time, but the, the, the worst period was from, I would say, 66, 67. Yeah. And that, that caused a lot of deaths. Mm. Yes, Aidan definitely had an impact on me. Um, it's the first time I'd really been away from my family for a long time. Uh, I think I was a great deal more compassionate when I came back and more aware of what I had. Happier, a better person. I think, when I came back. St Morgan, when I arrived, and up until mid-60s, there were three squadrons of Shackletons here. And you, you spend a lot of time on deployment. Uh, some nice places, some very not nice places, but uh, very, very busy. Uh, St Morgan, was a 24-hour station. It was also a master diversion unit. If every airfield in the country closed, this one was still open. Uh, but the three Shackleton squadrons, you spent six months of the year, not on one deployment, but on several deployments. It would add up to about six months of the year. You spend away from your family. Busy, busy, busy. Canada, South Africa, they all had Shackleton's. So you'd be deployed to Nova Scotia, Cape Town, Madagascar. We did three months. I did three months then in Madagascar for the Beirut, for the uh, real Dizian crisis, patrolling the Byrus Strait. There was always a deployment of some sort. Well, the proudest point is becoming aircrew for me. Um, I loved my job as an airframe fitter, but flying is something else. It's uh, a very, very rewarding job um, and I became quite good at it and, and I really enjoyed it. I was very sad when I ruptured my back and was no longer allowed to fly. We were flying a nine-hour trip out of Malta. I was stationed at Malta at the time 
and uh, I, I cannot name names, but we had a co-pilot who uh, was rather ineffectual. But he was told he had to do three circuits and bumps at the end of this nine hour um, sortie we'd done. And on the second one, he dropped it from about 50 feet. And I was sat in radar, which is right on top of the main spar of the airplane. And the impact um, ruptured my disc. It wasn't straight away a problem, but over the coming days, it got worse and worse and worse until I ended up in hospital for six weeks in Malta and then Kazivak to the UK. So I was paralyzed from the waist down until they did the operation on me. But it meant I couldn't, I couldn't fly again. I lost, you needed A1 category health to fly and I was reduced to A4. I had no feeling at all in my, from the waist down until they did the operation on my spine at RAF Hospital Rawton, which is near Swindon. While I was grounded from flying, I had a job in the <coughs> flight simulator here in St. Morgan. Uh, and also, I happened to be the chairman of the mess, um, and John was my entertainment man. And I think probably the couple of years that we were together, we put on some of the best shows this station's ever seen. Cabaret night every six weeks. I went to Buckingham Palace to get an MBE, and the Queen put it there, and I was. That was everything I ever. I didn't strive to get an MBA, but they gave it to me because I enjoyed my job and we were working all the hours God made. Prior to that, I'd collected a BM as a sergeant here. Um, I was at, I think it was Lossiemouth at the time, working on Buccaneers, and we, I was doing because I was separated from the family, the family was still living in Weybridge, and I was in Scotland, which was 758 miles down the road. <laughs> I was working seven days a week, basically. I was a warrant officer. We had uh, serious commitments with Buccaneer. Still in maritime force, but maritime attack as opposed to maritime reconnaissance. And Saturdays and Sundays were just occupied by working and uh, my night shift would come in at four o'clock and leave us up at half past seven in the morning when a day shift came in. So it was fairly intensive work. Somebody recognised it, and it would be one medal. So to take the family to Buckingham Palace was quite an achievement. We're all very proud of John. <laughs>